So uh, Superfund, it's a really interesting settlement uh, as, a, as a panel gets, gets ready. It's a legislated settlement where um, unlike uh, the, certainly uh, unlike the Gulf oil spill, uh, establishing liability was very much central uh, to the settlement uh, and a uh, huge amount of creativity uh, was involved. And we're, we're lucky to have Barry Breen who currently runs the Superfund program at EPA, longtime friend, a wonderful expert. Uh, he's the acting as administrator for the EPA Office of Land and Emergency Management. Commentators include uh, Judge Nancy Firestone of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, who uh, played a key role in uh, developing many of the concepts in the law and then implementing them, and David Ferrer, uh, Greenbaum, Rowe, Smith, and Davis. These are all my old friends uh, whom I invited. Uh, David uh, uh, has been a Superfund practitioner and expert for many years uh, and will give a state pers perspective. Barry? I'm going to stand here because I want to be able to see the slides. What a service from both the center and the law school to pull the meeting together. And there are a number of Superfund uh, national, world, global experts in the room, uh, on the panel certainly, and in the room as a whole. And we're, we're so looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to this for weeks, David, so thank you. I'm going to experiment for a minute to make sure I know how to advance. Okay. So one thing about the title, I just want to point out to you, uh, this date uh, is my, well, I'm going to do it without, there we go. The, the, the Superfund statute dates from 1980. That'll become important momentarily. And I wanted to point out that the first word is comprehensive. There's some doubt about that, but we'll um, come up. So outline uh, for the next few minutes. We're going to talk about some context. We're going to talk about the nature and scope of, of corporate liability, and then the scope of injuries, what CERCLA covers and what it doesn't. <laughs> so first, the introduction and context. This chart is up here. It's a little uh, fuzzy. Uh, that's partly intentionally. <laughs> I really just wanted you to see the forest. We can come back if we need to see the trees. This is from EPA's website. It went up last month. On the left-hand side are the, uh, the axis of hundreds of millions of dollars per year in Superfund private party commitments, and arrayed across the horizontal axis are year by year. So for the last uh, 10 or so years, uh, even in the lowest points, Superfund is doing about a half a billion dollars of uh, business a year in terms of getting private party commitments. And in some years, it spikes to over uh, two and a half or even $3 billion. So that as of right now, uh, in this 38-year-old statute, this one of these workhorses of environmental law, uh, private parties are performing the response action at about 60% of the ongoing remedial action. So for the most part, Superfund cleanups get done uh, by private parties, and that's due in no small part to the liability system. And it would be um, uh, quick to recognize that there are many people, many institutions, who get to share credit in that. So Congress, of course, and the executive branch, uh, and then the courts, and so will, and the states and some private entities. So I have picked out to walk you through 12 attractive features that make Superfund uh, an attractive um, system for federal and state government plaintiffs. I don't think there's magic about the number 12. I think other people could pick out more, but, um, but I went ahead and picked out 12. So we'll walk through. Uh, first, the first thing everybody says about Superfund liability is that it is strict, retroactive, and joint and several. Strict, that means without regard to fault, without regard to negligence. It's easy to take that for granted, but it's not the background in American tort law. Background rules would normally apply liability for negligence or for intentional torts, but not necessarily a strict liability system. And retroactive liability is not in the canons of construction for federal statutes. Most federal statutes would be presumptively uh, interpreted prospectively only for forward future conduct. 
but there is um, enough indicia of congressional intent that Superfund applies retroactively, meaning even if the conduct was entirely before 1980, liability can still attach. And then we said the three things everybody says are strict, retroactive, and joint and several. Superfund has a presumption of joint and several liability. By that we mean that any one liable party uh, could be responsible for the full amount. Several liability, similar name, completely different concept, would mean uh, each liable party is liable for only its comparative responsibility share. It's clear that Superfund has a presumption of joint and several liability. It's equally clear the third restatement of torts says that there's been a, a decades-long movement away uh, from joint and several liability in state common law, but Superfund preserves that for government, for plaintiffs generally, uh, uh, particularly government plaintiffs. And so um, that strict retroactive and joint and several liability. Then there's a more favorable causation standard under Superfund. One leading treatise says it's it, all you have to show is that the defendant put hazardous substances at a site, not that those particular hazardous substances are traceable to the need for the release. So it's a particularly favorable causation standard. One casebook says it, it shifts the burden onto the defendants. And there are very few defenses and exclusions. So it's quite common for there to be a large pool of responsible parties. So that's the fourth and fifth thing. The sixth thing is there is a presumption for government plaintiffs of consistency with the federal uh, guidelines. This is the national contingency plan. Like a good EPA lawyer, I don't travel without it. And the national <laughs> contingency plan um, uh, the governments, state and federal, get to uh, have this presumption of consistency. For environmental lawyers, what we normally expect under the Air Act or the Water Act or the Safe Drinking Water Act, the big media statutes, what we normally expect is a system in which the federal government sets up a framework and states can apply to be authorized to implement that framework. But it's a sort of government has to, a federal government has to approve state government um, execution. Not so in Superfund. In Superfund, right from the start, every state is uh, able to use Superfund every time. And states can even pick and choose. Sometimes this, sometimes that, sometimes some combination of the other. And so it's a low transactions cost system for states to pick up. All they have to do is do it. And then, um, in addition, with extremely rare uh, um, exceptions, CERCLA never preempts state law. It always adds to. It's one more choice a state government plaintiff could have. It's not a system of, uh, of either express uh, uh, preemption or even field preemption. CERCLA's just there for you. Um, in addition to actual cleanup costs, what it costs to send the bulldozers out to take the soil up, the, uh, the dredges to clean the sediments, that kind of thing. Uh, in addition to those actual cleanup costs, as long as they're documented, uh, other important costs can be covered as well. Planning, oversight, enforcement, um, in some cases prejudgment interest and that sort of thing. Declaratory judgments can be available. Uh, under Superfund, particularly for um, government plaintiffs. And the EPA has promulgated model documents. Why would that matter? Well, because it lowers transactions costs. And for that matter, they are um, written from a point of view of a government plaintiff. So it creates a starting point. Although always, always you need an agreement for a consent decree, by having this starting point, and it's on the website, they're easily accessible by everybody, it creates a sort of, well, here's we start from, everything becomes a give um, from there. And so that can be quite helpful to state government plaintiffs. And then finally, uh, in, a, in a, an important step that's not as apparent at the outset, is that EPA and states can offer incentives to settlers, such as contribution protection. By that we mean that by settling with a few early settlers, they can be assured that they won't be sued by other defendants still in the mix. 
And this is important because there are at least two sources of cost in a Superfund case. One is how much does it cost to clean up, and the other is how much does it cost to pay the lawyers. And by giving contribution protection, um, and only federal and state government plaintiffs can do that, by giving that contribution protection, you can incentivize settlers to come early to the table and settle with the EPA or a state. So I said there were 12, there probably are more, but it's 12 that I picked um, to get us started. And then uh, what does CERCLA cover and what doesn't it? Here's where the word comprehensive at the beginning might be of some, um, some uh, question mark. So first, CERCLA covers response costs, including uh, related enforcement costs. By response costs, we mean what does it take to protect the environment, to make the health, public, health, public health protected and, um, and the environment protected. EPA's model document includes some reopeners for unknown future injuries. And CERCLA covers natural resource damages, and there are a number of um, people in the room who know that uh, as best as anybody in the world. The, CERC, the EPA, which is not typically a natural resource damage trustee, the EPA website emphasizes the word restore uh, to distinguish between natural resource damages and response costs. If response costs are about getting contamination out of the environment, filtering the groundwater, cleaning up the dredge, um, dredging the, the sediment, cleaning up the soil, if response costs are about getting contamination out of the environment, natural resource damages are about restoring, making the environment whole, putting the habitat back to where the bird years, as Brian said, can be, um, can be uh, accommodated, as well as the reasonable costs of damage assessment. So the two key things that CERCLA provides are the response costs, the cleanup costs, and natural resource damages. But there are things that it doesn't cover. CERCLA's younger sibling with an attitude, the Oil Pollution Act, which came 10 years after CERCLA. Uh, the Oil Pollution Act covers petroleum, but not CERCLA. CERCLA doesn't cover petroleum, natural gas, or this broad narrative term, pollutants or contaminants. EPA can clean up using government appropriations EPA can clean up a pollutant or a contaminant, but only hazardous substances uh, give, give um, way to liability. At the same time, hazardous substances includes an amazing amount. The National Contingency Plan, which I traveled with here today, has a partial list of hazardous substances that is 70 pages long in the Code of Federal Regulations. So Superfund covers a lot. Not absolutely everything, maybe that word comprehensive, was um, an optimistic one, but still, Superfund covers hazardous substances, but it doesn't cover all of that for everything. So I mentioned it covers for cleanup costs, response costs, and natural resource damages, but for the most part, it also covers health studies when, when done by um, applicable federal agencies. But for the most part, that's it. So for example, although the Oil Pollution Act covers uh, some private causes of action, like property damage and lost subsistence use and even lost government revenues and lost profits, all that's a very private uh, cause of action, lost profits and earning capacity. The Oil Pollution Act covers all of that, CERCLA covers none of that, and neither federal statute covers some of the things that common law causes of action can reach like medical expenses, pain and suffering, wrongful death, and so on. So the comprehensive in Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act might be um, a bit of an overstatement. At the same time, while CERCLA doesn't do everything, what it does do, it does pretty well. CERCLA has injunctive relief. It's available for the federal government, not for state governments, but there are ways to fill the gap for state governments, including a companion statute, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, where states could uh, use a federal cause of action through the, the citizen suit provision and through state law, statutory, and common law. So where does that leave us? I wanted to go back to um, a slide early on, which was this one. 
which is that CERCLA, Superfund, has attractive features for governmental plaintiffs, federal and state. EPA gets to take a little bit of credit for some of it. Congress gets to take a lot of credit for a lot of it. The courts get to take a lot of credit. And states get to take a lot of credit as well as some private parties. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy and David, and I'll come join you over there. Well, it's very nice to be here. <clears throat> David and I go for, um, even further before the amendments to Superfund, um, which is how we became friendly, is when the Superfund amendments were passed in 1986, there was a major sort of education campaign that took place. I was working at the time at the Department of Justice, and I had the task of being DOJ representative on Superfund reauthorization. Now, you remember 1986, it's a Republican administration. Ronald Reagan is president of the United States. And there's a major effort at what is known as tort reform. And so we are doing Superfund reauthorization at a time when joint and several and perpetual liability is not a favorite topic. And so I, there were three women, actually, who were involved in that Superfund reauthorization. Myself, a woman named Linda Fisher, who became mm. the deputy administrator of EPA, and a woman named Ann Shields, who eventually became the chief of staff to the Department of the Interior when David was there. And we were the three girls against 500 registered lobbyists in 1986, <laughs> OK? And literally, we were girls at the time, all right? <laughs> so no program is perfect, but how did Superfund sort of become in a way, a very good success story, all right? One advantage, different than many others, is no one's in favor of hazardous waste, okay? <laughs> you don't have people who smoke it, use it, find it attractive, can sell it in any way. It's hazardous waste, and that is helpful, because everybody knew hazardous waste was a problem, and we knew that this was, this was not a regulatory program, okay? We weren't regulating, we were gonna clean up because we were having really the beginning of a, in a way of what has now become post-industrial America, all right? And there was a legacy of post-industrial America, just a bunch of crap that had been left all over the place. Some of it, by the way, caused by other environmental laws. If you can't put it in the air and you can't put it in the water, you're gonna put it on the land, all right? So we, we were a little bit of a victim of our own success in a sort of regard. So the theory of Superfund was, and how do you get a statute like this passed? It's public hysteria, all right? There was a woman named Lois Gibbs. She lived in Buffalo, New York. And, and I have to say, that's the interesting thing in terms of where we sort of are with these ads and so forth. We didn't have a media that was so divisive, all right? So everybody was watching the same news. And it's very interesting when that happens because you then don't have sort of groups but you couldn't get much of a constituency in favor of waste. It just, it just didn't ring true. Superfund reauthorization comes about in 1986. And why do we need it reauthorized? Because it was funded by a tax on the petroleum industry. The petroleum industry, and this is an example of sort of kind of how do you want to deal with these kinds of schemes. The petroleum industry, which Barry noted doesn't pay in this program, that was the pass they got. You pay a tax, you get a pass, right? And that money was then used to cover the folks who were going to be liable. Now, who, here's the dilemma you have in this, this litigation as well as in the statute. We're bringing together not one industry. We're bringing together everybody, transporters, all right? That's Joe, okay? We then have generators, the Fortune 500, as well as everybody else who generates waste. And we have the waste owners, who always conveniently disappear, OK? It's just easy to just say, I'm walking, unless it was a company-owned site. And so for us, and we were in the litigation group before this legislation gets started, joint and several liability is not critical. It's, it's, it's absolutely the key to the system because we have to find a way to clean up what had been identified as over a 1,000 terrible hazardous waste sites, finding people who were liable, and if we had a traditional liability scheme where we had a fingerprint waste, it could have never been done. We also knew we couldn't make it a government program. We don't have enough people. We didn't have enough skills in order to get the job done. 
So we wanted private people to do the work. So we come to the 1986 reauthorization to reauthorize the tax, okay, which is now expired. But the theory was is we need that money from the oil industry, all right? We're going to get it reauthorized, and we are in a very blessed period. And the best, the best part of that blessed period is we had very intelligent people in Congress at the time, all right? George Mitchell is the minority leader, former federal judge. You can sit down and talk about joint and several liability, all right? We would have meetings with people sitting down and actually talking about, I don't like joint and several liability. And so the reason we have a settlement program in Superfund is really because of Al Simpson from Wyoming. Al Simpson said, I think it's unfair. And I'm in a closet with the man, which today would have been problematic. But then, <laughs> No one thought twice about it. I'm teasing, nothing obviously happened. But what I'm <laughs> suggesting is <laughs> Al Simpson and I, uh, yes, Al Simpson and I, and he's saying to me, if you come up with a Superfund settlement program, I'll go along with the liability scheme. And the idea was exactly what Barry is saying. What we're going to do is we're going to have a de minimis provision, which was how you're gonna get the one barrel generator out of there. There was always this mythological person who only brought one barrel to the site and he had every representative on the hill just you know, telling his tale. We were going to have to have, though, a way to get people out. We were going to commit to identifying as many PRPs as possible, generators, transporters, as well as site owners. We were going to also make sure that EPA had the ability, and I don't think it does it very often, to do a non-binding allocation of responsibility. If you want us to figure out what you're liable for part of the cleanup, we will do that. And finally, what we were going to do was two other things. Barry, Barry Frank, Barney Frank had a constituent in Cambridge who unfortunately had bought their bicycle repair shop on top of a circle site, all right? And that guy said, I had no, I just didn't know. How did I know that? And Barney Frank said, we need an innocent landowner provision. We need a proviso in which we are going to make sure that somebody who inadvertently purchases a site isn't going to be liable. And then finally, we needed this concept of contribution protection. If you settle with us, then you're not going to be liable to anybody else. Now, the negative things that we had to convince the Hill to keep in order to do that was not only joint and several liability and perpetual liability, because we actually put in release provisions that said, by law, you can't walk away forever. But we also needed pre-enforcement review provisions which precluded you from challenging your liability or challenging the cleanup. Because once lawyers get involved, and I think it was very nice that our keynote speaker spoke so highly of us, we engage in a lot of transactional issues, and delay is one of them, and so it was very imperative that we got it done. So the focus that we had was on cleanups. The focus that we had was to make sure that we had incentives for settlement. That is unique in the law, and it has been phenomenally successful. Now, I mean, people can criticize the program, but what I will say is you don't see people marching in the streets saying, let's address those hazardous waste sites. Now, maybe it's gotten too We've become too complacent, that's possible. But I will say there was a study done, it's, it was done in a 2007 report to Congress that was done by uh, what was called the Superfund Settlements Project, which is made up of industry, uh, together with nonprofits, and basically said um, almost all of the sites, and there were over a thousand, have been at least to the most part controlled. There may be some debate, but for the most part. And it's been done, it's estimated, to 20, 30 percent less in cost than it would have been had private party, I mean, had the government undertaken those tasks. And, and so I compliment the people who have done this work for doing a phenomenal uh, job. But I will say the only way you get settlements is if you have a very draconian liability scheme. Okay? If people think they can get out from liability, it's worth the risk to litigate. It's only when they realize there's a real cost if I lose does it bring it down? So I'm going to take two minutes and change topics very, very quickly. Because the same time the 1986 amendments are going on for circular reauthorization, there is Congress also considering the issue of vaccine damage liability. 
all right? And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Vaccine Act. It so happens that that is the statutory scheme that is in my court, as the Court of Federal Claims. And it's, it's worth noting that both of the CERCLA amendments as well as the 86 Vaccine Act were actually pretty progressive times to figure out ways to deal with liability issues in the context of public health and exposure. By 1986, several major manufacturers of vaccines, as well as doctors and nurses, no longer wanted to administer vaccines any longer because they were all being sued. Why? Because there are a certain percentage of people who really do have negative reactions to vaccines. And so what Congress came up with was a liability scheme that took liability away from the people who give the shots and the people who make the vaccines and made the United States the first place you come to make a claim. I raise that because it strikes me as this is a sort of potential model almost in the opioid situation where there may be legitimate uses, but the abuse, I mean, still, you have to recognize a health effect. In 86, the statute passes, and this is how it works. Before you can sue a doctor or a vaccine manufacturer, you must file a claim against the United States, it's really HHS, in my court, in the Court of Federal Claims. That there is by HHS, the statute had originally, and HHS has expanded it, has actually identified a table of vaccines that are covered. How many of you had a flu shot? You're covered. How many of you had a sore arm from your flu shot? You're covered. All right, so the HHS identifies vaccines and identifies exposed, I mean, mm, I don't want to say adverse reactions that can be in even some instances as, as difficult as death, but fairly rare, all right? And you, if it's on the table, the vaccine's on the table and the response is on the table, then you will be compensated by the United States, all right? How are you compensated? Every time you had that flu vaccine, you have paid an excise tax. That excise tax has created a fund that fund is administered by the Department of Treasury, but HHS is the one who is reviewing the claims. If you come to my court and it's a table case, you will get paid. If you have a response that is not on the table, all right, but it is a response, you can also pursue your case, but then you need to prove causation, both general causation, can this vaccine cause this reaction, and specific causation, can it, did it actually cause it to you? Still, though, a little bit more of a liberal causation standard than the regular tort case, all right? It doesn't have to be proven to a medical certainty, but it has to be a reasonable, um, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's sort of you, it has to be enough evidence <coughs> from enough people to suggest that that is in a, in a likely um, scenario. Those vaccine cases um, are the most well-known. The most well-known situation of that was the autism omnibus proceeding, right? There was, there's, we're now living in this anti-vaccine world, a very frightening time. It all started with people saying, it was a doctor in England who has actually lost his license, he may even be in prison, set, saw a correlation between two-year-olds who got a vaccination and demonstrating autism. He took that correlation to mean causation. And people said, well, I'm not gonna have my kid have a vaccination. And then kid people, unfortunately, had children with autism sued. We had five, over 5,000 claims. And that proceeding took place with representative plaintiffs and so forth, but ultimately it was determined that there's no evidence to support that, and they lost. But it is, so far, there have been, from what I understand, over 15,000 claims in addition to those filed. About $3 billion has been paid out. All of this information is on my court, the United States Court of Federal Claims website. And I commend people how the statute works and so forth to look at it. Uh, we only have eight special masters. We now, because we've added a bunch of vaccines but haven't had its special masters, there's now an effort to get more of them. They are the ones who deal firsthand with uh, the claims when they come in. There's a whole special settlement unit 
that kind of helps to process them call, um, that has, uh, does the cases there where HHS agrees to pay or a settlement is possible. Um, and uh, it has at times been a criticized program, but I would have to say, um, you know, this anti-vaxxing thing is, is, is deeply uh, concerning, but it is an amazing program that has allowed vaccines to be manufactured and, and doctors to give them. One final note for the lawyers in the room. Unique to any law in the United States, you are compensated as an attorney. The attorney's fees are, are reimbursable whether you win or not, hmm. so long as you have a reasonable case. It's to encourage people to have the vaccines done. If you think there's a problem, you can sue, and then you get your attorney's fees. And there's a whole table uh, in D.C. where many of us are from. There's something called the, you know, the Laffey table, which is sets the uh, lawyer's fees if you prevail in a case. Um, <coughs> and our court has a similar thing for attorney's fees as well. So I tried to do that quickly. Okay. You did. All right. Yeah, you did. So. Um, some, uh, some commentary from the state perspective, also from the private party perspective. Uh, but first of all, a thank you to David for putting together this very exciting program. I'm delighted to be a part of it, and it's a real pleasure to be up here with Barry and, and with Nancy, given the, their long history on these issues. Um, so we have this very powerful federal law that's being used in the way that, that you've heard described. We then also have uh, very similar laws in, in every state, uh, law, CERCLA-like, Superfund-like laws in, in every state. They're typically called CERCLA analogs, and they provide the same sort of power to the state governments to pursue parties to clean up sites under state law. And, and, and they also provide some very powerful private party causes of action, as does the federal law. Uh, you, you heard Nancy talking about how the federal government would carefully research parties that they think are responsible parties or have established our responsible parties or RPs. At the beginning, they're only potentially responsible parties or PRPs, uh, and, uh, and the same thing happens at the state level. Uh, for example, in New Jersey, uh, which has been a primary focus of, of my uh, career and work, we have the Spill Compensation and Control Act. In fact, the Spill Act, as it's called, predated CERCLA by four years. We had a strict liability environmental cleanup law in 1976. CERCLA was 1980. Uh, it's a law that covers uh, not just the hazardous substances of CERCLA, but all hazardous substances, including all petroleum products. And in fact, we already have a standard for uh, one of the PFAS substances. You may have all, we keep having these emerging contaminants of concern. You know, we think we've, we've gotten to maturity in the environmental law field. The litigations have played out. Uh, what's gonna happen to all the environmental litigators? Uh, and then all of a sudden, we start to hear about these per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, PFAS uh, that are extremely toxic and extremely dangerous, and it's the new wave of a, a contaminant of concern. New Jersey already has a cleanup standard for one of them, PFNA, and we're beyond the point where uh, substances can be analyzed to the parts per million or billion. We typically look at groundwater in parts per billion and, and soil in parts per million. For PFAS, we're looking at levels in the parts per trillion as the cleanup level. Uh, and, and in fact, with, with a cleanup standard at 13 for PFNA in, in New Jersey, the, the detection limits get all the way down to five or six parts per trillion. The science is amazing. It's changing. It's always changing the practice. Um, at any rate, I, I digress a little, but it, it, it's, you have a very broad, in New Jersey, a very broad range of hazardous substances. Uh, and you have a very powerful private party cause of action. Uh, which I started to talk about. Both under federal law and state law, the government brings its case against private parties, companies, some governmental entities, and those parties have to start to negotiate because of the joint and several liability standard. But do they leave it there? No. Where you've got a multi-million dollar or billion dollar cleanup site, what are you gonna do? You're gonna look for other responsible parties 
and you turn around and you start third-party actions. It's, uh, it's another area of cost, investment, everyone uses the word transactional cost, it's another huge area of transactional costs, bringing in other parties uh, who, uh, who the primary group thinks are responsible or has established are responsible. Uh, now, under the CERCLA, there are various statutes of limitations that have been uh, added. Uh, I'll tell you right now, in New Jersey, our state Supreme Court has held that under the Spill Act, there is no statute of limitations uh, under our Spill Act, either for the government to bring cases or for private parties who've cleaned up uh, to bring cases. So I, I really want to stress this point that we've got the government going after uh, uh, private parties, and we've got uh, we've got private parties going after other private parties and, and municipalities. Um, you heard about natural resource damage laws uh, on the federal level, and as you heard in the Gulf discussion already, there are natural resource damage laws on the state level. Um, they are also the source of a good deal of uh, negotiation and litigation. Uh, one interesting thing that was happening in New Jersey for a while, uh, New Jersey was the first state to, um, to pass a transaction-triggered environmental law. It was originally called ECRA, the Environmental Cleanup Responsibility Act. It was revised some years later and is now the Industrial Site Recovery Act, or ISRA. Uh, it requires, to this day, that when you're selling a property or a business, in a vast, in, in a very broad array of, of uh, industrial categories. You have to do an environmental audit and if necessary a cleanup as part of the transaction uh, so that the cleanup occurs when the money is on the table. Uh, until recently, fairly recently, this was some, a program overseen by our Department of Environmental Protection. They're the ones who had to issue the final sign-off letter, the no further action letter. Uh, and in New Jersey, that required not only finishing the environmental cleanup, uh, but also settling any natural resource damage claims. So that was very interesting. You couldn't get, to, you couldn't get your no further action letter and finish uh, the, the, uh, the environmental proceedings uh, until the NRDs were dealt with, and they were virtually always dealt with on a monetary basis, not, not through a, a supplemental project. Uh, through various calculations. That actually, the NRD part of the New Jersey system isn't working that way anymore because New Jersey is also one of the states that started to privatize certain aspects of environmental cleanup. So now the consultants who've been working on the cleanups, uh, certain of them get licensed as licensed site remediation professionals and they stand in the shoes of the state in issuing certain sign-offs so that now you don't get a, 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 a no further action letter from DEP. You get a response action outcome letter from an LSRP who, whose work is then reviewed at some point by DEP. But they decoupled NRD settlements from this process. I, I thought it was an interesting way to, to make sure that NRDs got dealt with uh, up front. Um, one of the things we were asked to, to think about in the context of our discussion uh, was the societal liability question, the socialization of cleanup costs. Um, is this the way to do it? Um, was this the right way to get cleanups done? Uh, well, certainly imposing the joint and several liability scheme has worked in terms of enforcement, and I think we all know that enforcement is necessary to get people to comply with the law. Um, at the same time, Congress made a, a decision when Superfund passed, right? Uh, we heard about a tax that was imposed on a certain industry, on the petroleum industry, to fund this Superfund, which provided the governmental funding uh, for cleaning up sites. But the decision was made not to impose a general tax on the public or on business. Uh, so. Instead, for 150 years of, uh, of heavy industrialization, uh, the, the decision was to target certain other parties and leave it to those parties to pursue uh, uh, third parties to collect their, their uh, 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 liability, their contribution to liability. So in, instead of the government saying, okay, we've got a lot of polluted sites, let's fund a cleanup by taxing, we're going to target these particular parties, 
parties who owned and operated properties while they got contaminated. Nancy was talking about landfill operators and those who bring contamination to those sites, the transporters, those who created the waste, the waste generators. All of these parties are deemed liable under the Superfund law, under the strict and several liability standard. And that's, you know, that's the decision that was made. So those parties then in turn, you know, turn to the third parties to get them into the mix. And that's where we get into transactional costs being significant. We also have a situation where you're a private party counselor, where you have clients who come to you in a case where they've been involved in a, been dragged into a Superfund suit, a surplus suit. And there's nothing that they've done wrong. They've generated a particular waste. They had the permit to handle the waste. They sent it to a waste disposal facility that was a licensed waste disposal facility. They've got the bills of lading for having transported the waste there. And when that waste facility has a problem and leaks, the liability is not just in the jurisdiction, in the hands of the waste disposal company. It's also the liability of the party who generated waste, even though they followed all of the rules. So it's a hard discussion to have with clients who say, why in the strict, why should I be liable when I did everything correctly? Because a decision was made. We're going to have this kind of a liability scheme. So we, as a result, we have these situations where transactional costs are significant. The federal government on the Superfund cases often has dozens, if not hundreds, of parties who are responsible parties. Those groups organize into committees to deal with how they're going to allocate liability among them. You heard all of the complex issues that were going on in the Gulf spill on a mega level. These kind of situations go on on a much smaller level in these groups of responsible parties who've been targeted to clean up sites. You get, you know, a hundred or more lawyers in a room. The PRP group gets divided into all sorts of different categories. There's a generators group. There's a ranger group. There's owner-operator groups. You know, they get divided up into private parties, governmental parties. They get divided up into the amounts of hazardous substances that have sent, that were sent, the toxicity, cooperating parties, non-cooperating parties, you know, ability to pay. And then you go through a very complex allocation system, not unlike, not nearly as complicated as what you're hearing discussed by the Gulf oil spill, but complicated enough that you get a whole subspecialty of experts, practitioners. You get PRP group leaders or common counsel. You get allocators, third-party neutrals doing the kind of work we heard the Gulf spill folks talking about, and technical consultants. So simply getting named in one of these lawsuits brings quite substantial transactional costs, and it's a torturous process. But in the end, the cleanups get done, the liabilities get allocated, and we go on. I was going to say, and college educations get paid for. Yes, a lot of college education. It was the Lawyers Relief Act of 86, I do remember. Right. The one thing I just wanted to add that is different than I remember when Ken Feinberg was talking, and that is insurance is very much involved in CERCLA. There was actually, during 86, an amendment that was being proposed from the insurance industry to say that insurance money could not be used to pay for Superfund cleanups. And that got a fair amount of traction until, actually, a few of us said, and now I'm at the Court of Claims, but it would have been an interesting takings claim to say that the government has now taken away my contractual liability. So they were persuaded a little bit by that theory not to do that. But insurance, Barry and I were involved in a major site that involved, because there's also federal facilities involved to have their own cleanup liabilities. But, I mean, settlements will have to go to places at a certain amount, to places like Lloyd's of London and so forth, as to whether or not they're going to be willing to go along with it. I mean, your company's at a certain level and at a certain point, 
it gets pushed uh, beyond that. Right, right. And early on in the, in, uh, in the liability scheme, when parties would be uh, sued either by the governments or by other private parties, one of the first places they would turn would be to their insurance sure. carriers under their business liability policies or their property policies. And, uh, and those policies were found by courts to, in many instances, cover, uh, to the extent of the policy, uh, the contamination and the cleanup costs. And then the insurance industry in the 80s went through a series of exclusion clauses. Uh, they, they kept getting knocked down by the courts, and they ultimately came up with, uh, by the mid-80s, what's called the absolute pollution exclusion um, uh, that really is a clause that's held up so that these days, in the modern era, if you really want coverage for potential environmental liabilities, you have to buy uh, a specific pollution legal, legal liability policy, which is uh, highly negotiated, for which the background due diligence has to be uh, quite detailed, uh, and, um, and they're hard to come by, and they have limited terms. So let's open it up for questions, uh, starting with mine. Uh, this was called the Super Fund, and at the time it was created, Nancy, was there, was it envisioned that this would re, really be primarily a private party funded cleanup effort? Uh, there was this notion of a super fund of federal dollars that were able to pay for cleanups where there were orphans or whatever. Um, it, it, it seems as though that has uh, sunk below the waves, that concept, and I don't think the tax is being paid anymore and isn't. there isn't any more money in the Superfund. Uh, but but uh, just curious, because that would have been potentially a way to have thought about uh, what David was just talking about, socialization to some extent, although he makes the important point it wasn't a general tax, uh, although that was considered in 1986, uh, I think, a, a general tax in order to, to sort of potentially socialize uh, the liability. I would say you have to, I mean, it's really timing is everything. This statute is passed in 1980 in the waning days of the Carter administration. It is written by a group of very intelligent uh, people from have a perspective of polluter pays, mm -hmm. and that concept remained. And so, I mean, there's, there was a gentleman named Tony Roisman, who um, was a public interest lawyer who was working at the department, was very influential in writing it, based it on some very, the New Jersey uh, and other laws, and the notion was no, that it was going to be a polluter pay. I mean, what was complicated yeah. is it's the only statute in which so many people from different walks of life have to come into a room together, all right, and try to figure it out. But no, that was always the thought, and then it became uh, gospel, that mm -hmm. we would focus it on, uh, the fund would only be there to do orphan sites, Mm -hmm. and to use for what we called at the time mixed funding for missing people in the program to make the deal go. So two, two thoughts. One is to elaborate on Nancy's point that it, it's enacted in the closing days in a lame duck Congress in which um, there's a contemporaneous letter from the Senate chairman and ranking member who are about to change places because the Senate switched and they write to their House counterpart, this, this bill didn't pass the Senate because most support it. It passed because most agreed not to oppose it. And so it's that fragile moment-to-moment -moment coalition. And the tax was, at the time, an essential ingredient. But the tax has not been collected since the end of 1995. Right. And so what's happening now, every year, starting in 1996, is Congress appropriates money into the trust fund from the general revenue. And so it's the same way your income tax and mine and everybody else's goes to fund government. About a billion to 1.1 billion goes into the super fund every year. And, and, the, and the states, the state analogs basically followed that model uh, of not funding cleanups, except for certain specific funds. And many states have underground storage tank cleanup funds particularly for, for uh, residential owners and the like, but, but, but generally it's been the same scheme. Questions? 
Charlie. I hate to speak twice, but to the extent that the purpose of this conference is looking at these different regimes for ideas on how to handle things, um, I guess I can make the point that I don't think is a neighbor, which is people often criticize Superfund for the incredibly high transaction costs. Um, and it seems to me as a matter of history, folks over there will, will correct me disagree, but because that fragile moment in 1980 resulted in a bill that had stripped out Term strict liability. He stripped out the term joint and several and said, mm -hmm. instead, look to how the Clean Water Act does it under the 311 provision. It took like 10, 15 years for litigation to finally confirm what the standards were. It seems to me that people were looking at Superfund as a model um, for how to handle some of these complex health um, issues. That the history of these, of these similar programs in New Jersey and elsewhere. Where, I'm not sure about New, Jer New Jersey, but where the standard of liability was in the statute in the first place, that that might result in a less transaction cost high regime if people were to look at Superfund as being a model. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of the state programs have the have that liability have the liability. Most of them have the liability standard baked into the statute. Yeah, you, you couldn't do that. I mean, you couldn't get it through, but I will say, having spent a lot of time working on reauthorization, because the, by that time, even in 86, <laughs> there had been enough lawsuits that had established joint and several liability and retroactive liability <clears throat> that I was very careful when I was helping to draft legislative history to write this clarifies and confirms what is, in fact, been the law of, of, the, ca of the case law to make sure that we were not reopening issues by not using those words, joint and several. The closest we got was getting contribution protection, which would have made no sense in a mm -hmm. scheme that did not have joint and several liability as a matter of law. I have another question, but I'll ask um, oh, if the floor is open for others other than me. I, I want to ask you guys uh, something that uh, came up uh, with the uh, Gulf oil spill, and that is the NRD yeah. as applied under Superfund. Yeah. We heard quite an extraordinary tale about uh, a remarkable, uh, remarkable in many ways, uh, NRD settlement in connection with an enforcement action. Um, NRD was a, an important part of the Superfund law that really had a different flavor than the cleanup itself, but seems to have not been successful. I'm curious if you agree, and if so, um, and you were, you were back at it from the beginning, how would you potentially uh, make it uh, work better uh, now that we see that it actually can uh, work better? You want to start, David? <clears throat> well, I, one of the reasons I brought up the, the New Jersey example during the period of time when, um, when uh, in order to wrap up a transaction triggered cleanup, you had to complete the, uh, the NRD settlement. Uh, there, there could have been or there could still be some aspect of uh, NRD requirement uh, leading up to you know, one, of the, one of the key points along the circle process, sure. whether it's the rod or what, whether... But it's, it's always it's, been it, treated as something that other people worry about later. Right, and, and, and part of that is because the trustees aren't actually sitting at the table with you, right? right? So if, if they could somehow be involved in the process, that would, that would be one way to go back and restructure. Were you saying, just a clarification in the New Jersey example, that people essentially monetize it and there's a payment uh, made for NRD as, a, as opposed to the actual application of restoration activities? For, uh, for many cases where the natural resource damage was relatively mild mm. uh, and uh, the state wanted to monetize it and get the money into the treasury, mm. that, 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 that's how it was happening. That's so, interesting. Yeah. So the vast, in fact, the vast majority of the cases we are closing under our ISRA program the NRD damages wound up being relatively small sums. Nancy? I, I would just say, having worked on it at the time, I mean, the focus was on sort of the industrial sites and, the, and they were all largely on the east. New Jersey 
was very well known for having an extra large collection of, of sites because they were the ones who began working on it earlier on. When we got to the west and some of the mining sites, then the issue became more prevalent. But it does matter just to use, use the Hamilton expression we all now use, who's in the room. The natural resource, EPA runs this program and, and they don't necessarily bring in right. their brothers right. and sisters from Interior and NOAA unless the state really probably yeah. puts some pressure on to say there's a natural resource damage component because they, the state, will be the beneficiary of yeah. any reclamation mm -hmm. that takes place. Yeah. And it is the case. In, in almost every site, EPA is not a natural resource trustee. I think, I think the Gulf oil spill is the exception. Yeah. But, but other than that, we are not. And, and so the Forest Service and. And, and maybe that wasn't a good idea. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're not yeah. in the room. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank our fabulous panel. That was really interesting.